Uh, Sergeant, will you begin recording? PC's rolling. Cloud is recording. Sergeant John, you may begin. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much. Let me gavel in today's meeting. Good morning. My name is Fernando Cabrera. I am the Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations. We have been joined by my colleagues and committee members, myself, Perkins, Powers, and Yeager. I believe that's what we have at this moment. Today, the committee will be conducting oversight on an important topic as we think about COVID-19 recovery, the future of city government office space. We are conducting we are conducting this hearing remotely today because council staff and the vast majority of the city's office-based workforce is still working from home. In fact, surveys have found that as of October, less than 20% of the office workers in greater New York City have had returned to the office. Midtown Manhattan has been described as a ghost town. And indicators point to low demand and high vacancy rates in the city's commercial real estate market. The city itself is a sizable player in this market. DCAF, the agency responsible for overseeing the city's real estate portfolio, manages 55 city-owned buildings, totally over 50 million square feet. DCAF leases some of the space to private tenants, generating over $50 million in revenue in fiscal year 2020. It also enters into lease agreements with private landlords to house various city agency offices. DCAS rents approximately 22 million square feet of private office space for city agencies. In June, the council passed local law 75 of 2020, sponsored by majority leader and council member Lori Pombo, establishing a task force to recommend protocols for the safe reopening, reopening city agency. The bill also requires city agencies to develop their own policies for reopening to be reviewed by the task force. The task force is required to report on agency compliance with the law every 90 days until the law expire. The first report was due on October 24, 2020. The committee will be conducting oversight on the implementation of this law today, how the pandemic and a sudden disruption of office work patterns will affect urban businesses, districts, and the use of office space in the long term is unknown. Many observers believe that the previous norm of workers commuting to office offices five days a week will shift. Office buildings will have to adapt to stricter public health protocols. And many see this as an opportunity to transform some office buildings and hotels into residential buildings, including for affordable housing. Whatever the future holds, I think we as a city government have learned a lot the, over the last year about the resiliency and flexibility of our city's workforce. We have also learned about the urgent infrastructure needs our city must address in order to make work from home a viable possibility for all non-essential city employees. As we plan to return to our offices, we must take the advice of public health experts into account. I look forward to hearing from the administration today, as well as our local businesses, labor and academic stakeholders about the ways in which our city can make public health and workplace safety a priority as we begin to reopen our government. Also want, I also want this hearing to be an opportunity to discuss long-term ideas such as converting office buildings into affordable housing. 
The committee will also be hearing a bill, Introduction 374 of 2018, sponsored by Councilman Brennan. This bill will disqualify any person convicted of felonies related to public corruption or depriving the public of honest services from holding the office of mayor, public advocate, controller, board president, or council member. The local law will take effect immediately. I also want to thank our committee staff, CJ Murray, Emily Forjohn, Elizabeth Hong, Sebastian Bacci, and many central staff working behind the scenes to make this remote hearing operate smoothly. I also want to thank my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for making this hearing possible. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Elizabeth Kahn, to go over procedure uh, items. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. I'm Elizabeth Kronk, Senior Policy Analyst to the New York City Council's Committee on Governmental Operations, and I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be representatives from the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Deputy Commissioner for Real Estate Services, Laura Ringelheim, will be providing testimony and Executive Deputy Commissioner Quentin Haynes will be available to answer questions. Panelists, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will be no second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Deputy Commissioner Ringelheim and Executive Deputy Commissioner Haynes, please raise your right hands. I will write I will read the oath once and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Ringelheim? I will. Executive Deputy Commissioner Haynes? I will. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Ringelheim, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I'm Laura Ringelheim, Deputy Commissioner for Real Estate Services at DCAS, and I'm joined today by Quentin Haynes, Executive, Executive Deputy Commissioner at DCAS. And I want to start by thanking you for offering us the opportunity to testify on the future of city office space. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the support we have received from this committee during this pandemic. I know that many of you have been working day and night to provide uh, and to protect the people you represent. And by working together, we have made sure that all New Yorkers are receiving the necessary support to fight COVID-19. Just one year ago, we could have never imagined what our city, our country and our world was about to face. And the COVID-19 pandemic has taken an enormous toll on the people of New York City from the terrible loss of human life to the economic pain felt by millions of our friends and neighbors, the reality that we live in today was almost unimaginable. But through it all, the city of New York and its dedicated public servants have worked to confront this pandemic and to sustain the services provided by city government. And to do this, the city has had to operate in new and different ways. And one of these changes to implement flexible scheduling options for much of our workforce. Since March, a majority of city employees have utilized flexible scheduling to work remotely all or part of the time. And this measure was taken to ensure the health and safety of our workforce. Nothing is more important than protecting our employees. So flexible scheduling has been extended to employees wherever possible. In addition, new health and safety best practices have been implemented to protect essential employees and others who access city facilities. City agencies have taken steps to promote social distancing and ensure appropriate cleaning measures in those facilities. DCAS has provided guidance to agencies to address further safety protocols for office spaces, hallway circulation, seating arrangements, common space occupancy, and the safest way to manage queuing when entering buildings. The work the city has done to adapt to the new realities from this pandemic has also sparked conversations on several topics, including the subject of today's hearing. 
And even before the pandemic, DCAS launched a space savings management team to make sure that we are tapping all available city owned and lease resources before we consider on taking additional lease costs. Our team strives to be at the forefront of space utilization, ensuring that office space for the city is both operationally efficient and cost effective. We're asking tough questions like are employee workspaces configured in the most optimal way and office and conference rooms appropriately sized. We're also working to ensure that we maximize city owned assets before looking to the rental market for possible solutions. And one example of this was the repurposing of 22 Reed Street. In the early days of this administration, the site was vacant with no planned use. And instead of going to the rental market, we were, we were able to transform the site and today it's at full capacity. Our efforts also include surveying city occupied buildings to create new and updated floor plans and create a new central repository for our real estate portfolio. This new repository has helped us fine tune space utilization efforts. And this work is already showing results. During fiscal year 2020, DCAS entered into, renewed or amended fewer leases than at any point over the past five years. We're realizing the benefit and cost savings and cost avoidance and this is especially important given the fiscal challenges the city's facing because of COVID-19. We have heard many interesting ideas about the future of office space, from realizing additional savings through flexible scheduling to imagining the use of these spaces entirely. While it's true that flexible scheduling during the pandemic has reduced the amount of office space that's currently being occupied by employees, much of this space is still being utilized. To confront the pandemic, the city has put its real estate assets to good use. For instance, 311 had to staff up considerably to respond to this crisis. And it had to do this while also following appropriate social distancing protocols. To accommodate this need, we were able to tap into existing office space so that 311 could continue its operations uninterrupted. We're also using the city's real estate portfolio for things like COVID testing and now for vaccine distribution. There are currently 56 city sites located throughout the five boroughs that are being used for COVID and antibody testing and nine sites for PPE distribution. We're also supporting the city's efforts to find additional locations that are suitable for vaccinations. All this crucial work will continue for the foreseeable future until this pandemic is in our rear view mirror. While we're not yet there, we've heard your questions about what's next when it comes to the city's real estate needs. In fact, there are conversations that are happening throughout the city and country as employers are confronting similar realities. But the simple truth is that it would be premature to say, while all options remain on the table for how the city will utilize office space and approach topics like flexible schedules, the most responsible way forward is to make sure that we do not make major decisions based on the immediate realities of where we are today, but where the city wants to be tomorrow. To do this, we must get through the challenges of this pandemic and thoughtfully consider future needs and priorities. The council and this committee will be a critical partner in this work. And I'm sure that you are thinking through similar questions for the future of city council. As we continue to explore this topic, we want to know your thoughts and consider your perspectives so that the best possible decisions are made and made in an inclusive way. We appreciate your support and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first, let me acknowledge we also been uh, joined by Council. I think I mentioned Councilmember myself. I just want to double check that I did. Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Deutsch, and Councilmember Diaz. I'm going to start with a couple of questions uh, and then allow for uh, my colleagues if they have any questions, and then I'll come back uh, with uh, the rest of the questions. Uh, I wanted to ask you. Uh, what percentage uh, of the city's office-based workforce is currently working from home? So, uh, Quentin, do you want to answer that question? I believe you. It... Can somebody so... mute him, please? <laughs> There we go. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, so currently right now, so DCAS does not track that number. Um, and so uh, we can follow up with you to give you more data on the current workforce of what, what is actually working from home. But DCAS um, as an agency does not track that number citywide. Is there an agency that tracks it? 
So uh, I think there are multiple uh, agencies that are tracking different aspects of it. Um, and so that's why I said I, I'll be happy to follow up on that question, but multiple agencies are a part of, of tracking that data. Okay. I uh, appreciate if you could get us that data. Uh, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, today, how many leases, uh, how many leases or privately owned space does the city have in its portfolio? Uh, and follow up questions with that. How many of these are multi-year leases? What is the average uh, or typical length of multi-year lease? And how are these lengths determined? So we have about 436 lease and license agreements currently. Um, you know, license agreements are short term. Uh, sometimes they're renewed for longer than a year, but they can be terminable at, uh, on 25 days notice. Leases range anywhere from, I would say, five years to 20 years. But on average, uh, when we make a determination, we consult with the agency to see what their needs are going to be and if they anticipate being in that space for long term. And we can usually realize a better rent if we can commit to long term, and it usually is better for the agency. So I would say the majority of our leases are at least 10 to 20 years. Do you happen to have uh, a number? How many of these multi-year uh, leases uh, we have? Well, if it's 436 lease and licenses, it's probably about, I would say 375 to 400 leases and they're multi-year. And most of them you say is uh, over 10 years. Most of them are over 10 years. Over 10 years. Uh, by the way, anybody defaulted on those uh, leases? No, <laughs> no, do you mean, well, so uh, council member, I just want to clarify, you're, you're asking how much private sector space we lease. Yes, private, right? yes. So, no, oh, sorry. We have, I'm sorry, yeah. that, that's for the, my next question. Okay. Yeah, I'm right, I'm right. No, so, the, yeah, the city is in good standing, I believe, on, on most of those leases, if not okay. all. Great, great. Well, that's a curious question. So uh, we, we, we are yeah. paying everyone, uh, on time? Yeah, the only time I believe that we, we sometimes get into trouble is if there's a, a registration issue or something that takes uh, a little bit longer, but in, in general, yeah, we're, we're paying on time. Okay, let me ask the next question, then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues and then I come back because I have quite a few questions. How many revenue generating leases of city-owned space does DCAS manage? And how many of these are multi-year leases? And what is the average? or typical length of these multi-year lease? So for the multi-year leases, we have uh, about 78 long-term leases. And on the short-term side, uh, it's about 346. Um, and some of those are leases, some of those are license agreements. Uh, for the long-term, they're all leases. And the long-term leases can range anywhere from 10 years to um, 20, 30 years with 20 year options to renew. Sometimes it, it will go up to 99 years. Um, so some of those are very long term. The short term, which is the uh, larger portfolio just by numbers of leases, is about 346. And those can be uh, month to month or year, year to year. And, uh, and what's the process? Uh, is there a request that is put out uh, or people? Uh, who may have interests of a building, they approach you, How is what's the process? So for the short-term portfolio, meaning you would just enter into a, you know, a, a short-term lease or license, and that has to be one day under a year, um, according to the administrative code, they can just approach us and inquire. And actually what we're working on is getting everything up on our website that could be available for a short-term license so that the public can really see and we can increase revenue and in, we decrease you know, some of the unused lots. And this helps the city because uh, you know, it's insured, someone else is taking care of it. It takes it you know, off the responsibility of the city to maintain it. Um, so, so right now it still exists that we're approached and we can enter into that agreement if the use fits that, that zoning and, and other considerations. Um, and for the longer term or, or leases that are over a year, that's by auction process. And that goes to the highest bidder. Hmm. Uh, since I'm, I'm, I wanna go back to my second question, 
I, I, I noticed, I was reading uh, an article yesterday from The Real Deal, and it mentioned that a law department uh, ran uh, from the Woolworth building. Are you involved in that? We did that lease for that. Uh, that yeah. well, uh, I'm just curious, uh, what do we pay there? Uh, I will have to look to get you that exact number. Um, that is, I believe, and I'm not sure which one you're referring to. I didn't see the article, but we, we, um, I think we have two leases in that building, and they were negotiated, I think, about a year and a half ago. I would, I would think that's a rather expensive uh, lease, and why there if it's so expensive? So I'm going to try and get you that number during the course of the testimony, but um, my recollection is it what it's not so expensive. It, it it's a very beautiful building and, and landmarked and uh, you know a special building, but the office rents were not that much. And when we look for uh, office leases, we generally um, you know almost without exception are extremely competitive. Well, I think one of the most competitive tenants that that you'll find in lower Manhattan. So I'm going to just take a guess and say <laughs> this number will not be shocking and it will be very uh, competitive with any other uh, class B building, which is usually what we look at. I'm happy to hear that. And uh, if you could give me that number, I will be even more impressed. OK, <laughs> so I want to turn it back uh, to the moderator and uh, we're, I'm going to invite my colleagues, and I see hands raised already, and then I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank I will you. now call on council members in the order they have raised. They have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You will have a total of five minutes to ask your questions and receive an answer from the panelist. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. First, we will hear from Council Member Yeager. Your time starts now. Good morning, Deputy Commissioner. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, happy New President's Day to everybody. Um, uh, my question is, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, you testified that you're not sure or don't know how many employees are working from home because DCAS is not uh, the agency, uh, the depository of that information. Um, my question along those lines is we know anecdotally and um, from our own experience uh, at the council that there are uh, many employees uh, or many office spaces that have not seen an employee return since March of last year. Uh, not, not a human being has entered into that foot space. So my question is, have, has there been any lease in the city of New York that has uh, expired during the course of the the current or the the current fiscal year that we're in right now, and has the city relinquished any leased office space at all during this time? Thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, so, the you know, I'll give you one example: City Council lease. Uh, had expired and we were actually in holdover uh, and have executed that lease agreement. Um, and that's for the 250 Broadway space. So that's one example of a lease that we have um, re-executed. We have not entered, I don't believe into any new space, but we have not um, relinquished any space either. Most, even though there is a lot of vacant, uh, I don't wanna say vacant space, there's a lot of employees that haven't returned to work, but agencies um, are still using their spaces they might not be at 100% capacity, they might not be at 50%, and given social distancing requirements, I would imagine that they are not, but they are still being used widely and throughout the city. Well, there have to be spaces that are being used for nothing more than glorified storage. There are still employees from every agency as far as the data that we know that are going into these spaces. And, and I say that we know this because we have been asked for uh, a lot of extra space. And, and some examples are, you know, to get grand juries back into action, they need to be socially distanced and they need extra space. Um, the example I gave during my opening testimony, 311 uh, had a ramp up and they need an extra space. Um, Department of Buildings is running the, the uh, situation rooms for DOE. They've also had a ramp up and they are still searching for extra space in order to have um, this staff socially distanced. And these are all staffs that have to be on site. So we, this is the kind of thing that we 
are still doing every day. We'll, we'll get these calls from these agencies who either need extra space or we'll call around to, to ask other agencies, are you using this space and can we use it? Um, but what we're finding is that in order to be socially distanced, a lot of that space is used. And of course, some of it isn't right now, but I think uh, you know, even with city council space, the intent is to go back to that space in some way, shape or form or, or decisions haven't been made of, of who is going to and when are they gonna go back. But we don't find that agencies have made any decision, oh, we're not gonna use this space and we're not gonna have staff return. So at this point in the middle of the pandemic, we, we haven't given up any space. Um, as to whether any of those leases have expired, city council is the one that comes uh, to mind right away, but there might be others. Well, it comes to my mind right away as well, because you know, just using that agency, our agency as an example, um, we're aware that there's space that no, not a human being has entered into since March of last year. Um, mm -hmm. uh, members of this body maintain offices at 250 Broadway and we have not entered into those spaces. We've not been allowed to. We're actually, you might as well rent out the council chamber for parties because uh, we haven't been in there either. Um, but there have to be agencies. The city of New York employs 300,000 or so people. There have to be agencies in the city that, uh, that there is an anticipation of, of a reduced workforce, such as to allow the city to make a determination that it doesn't need the space anymore. And I'm wondering if, uh, you know, at the end of, of, of the fiscal year, when we look at the numbers this year versus last year, will we be spending, will we have spent in this current fiscal year that we're in right now, more money on leased space or less money on leased space? And as we enter into the next fiscal year, uh, the FY22 uh, fiscal year, have we, will we have, will we be anticipating spending more money on leased office space or less money on leased office space? And my suggestion is, and not to, not to put words in your mouth, but my suggestion is that there's only one appropriate answer is less. It can't possibly be more and shouldn't be the same because we ought to be having, uh, as the mayor has said, um, he's intending on a three to one replacement ratio for attriting uh, uh, employees in the city there ought to be a plan that we're going to need less office space, uh, notwithstanding social distancing measures, where we, we are on the, on the uh, track to have the vaccination uh, at least by the end of this fiscal year done throughout the city of New York. So we're, we're not going to need the kind of social distancing and emptying, uh, but at the same time, we're not going to be able to afford what we currently have. So I guess my question really is, what's the plan to get rid of some of this dead office space? So I think this is exactly what our team has, uh, you know, been doing over the past couple of years and what we'll continue to do. So if we see agencies shrink in size, um, a lot of what we do is just, you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together in order to maximize that space. And if we find that an agency has shrunk by two thirds or a third or whatever the numbers might be, and they have additional lease space, then we'll look to get out of another lease and move folks over there. And, and this is what we constantly uh, are tracking and looking for. So mid pandemic, I don't know that it, you're, you're gonna see a, a jump or a decline in the numbers either way, but I think once there is some um, finality to what the plans will look like and you know agencies um, shrink, then we can certainly make those decisions as, as they roll up. Um, currently there is, uh, you know, there's, there's really not the ability just to say, okay, we know this agency is going to shrink by this much and we're going to get ready to give up this lease. But that is something that we look at constantly. And, and is, a decision is made before each decision to renew. Um, and our team will go out to the site, count desks, count heads, verify that information, and then make a decision ongoing. So we're always ready to do that. Um, it's just that it hasn't happened during this past year. Okay. My last question, Mr. Chair, uh, I appreciate if uh, I can go over the clock a little no bit. Problem. Um, no problem. Thank you, Chair. My, um, I, I would like to know, and I, and I appreciate if you, Commissioner, if you're not able to get us the answer right now, but I'd like to know uh, if you can tell us, um, not, and not encouraging the city to default or breach on its leases at all or to walk away from, from leases that are executed with time remaining, but uh, if you can tell us, uh, what leases are going to expire, where they are, how much we pay and what agency during the upcoming fiscal year um, so that we, as we enter into the budget now, can make determinations about whether or not agencies deserve to have 
uh, uh, appropriate cuts, as the mayor talks about uh, pegs and reducing agency costs, the one place that might be the easiest and the most painless to do so are on real property rental. And if we have the ability to do that as we go into the budget right now, I really would love if you're able to provide the chair of this committee a list of leases that are going to expire in the uh, immediate future for the remainder of this fiscal year, uh, the upcoming fiscal year and the fiscal year after that. So in other words, working by calendar year in 2021, 2022, 2023, so that the committee as it starts to look and the council as a whole, as it starts to look at the budget can go back to the administration and say, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna cut this agency by that much, well, we could find you a savings if you get rid of some of this dead office space that we're holding onto. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I can tell you right now that because we are always looking at five years out in terms of renewals, there's about 40 leases and license agreements that are going to expire. So we can certainly tell you what those are. Um, and, you know, most uh, you're probably asking mostly about office space, uh, uh, not industrial space um, or office daycare, space. office space. I mean, I, um, that we, that we can certainly provide you that information. Um, I, I just the Deputy Commissioner, just, I just want to remind you that, that at the beginning of the session of this council uh, in 2018, we, we, the council, stepped in and saved the city an enormous amount of money when a particular agency that we shall allow to remain nameless because of, uh, of their punishing tactics when they don't like council members um, uh, wanted to rent a boondoggle uh, a set of uh, office space that if we look at it right now and we hadn't stepped in and stopped it, we would have all been smacking ourselves in the head. Um, and fortuitously, we did stop it, and they seem to be making do just fine without having had that office space. And I'm, um, you know, it happened to have been the focus of this committee simply because uh, that's the agency that falls under this committee's jurisdiction. But um, I think that there are probably many agencies like that that kind of rent under the radar uh, space that nobody's really paying attention to. Um, and uh, I think it's important as we step into, you know, it's now approaching February, we're going to be start, we're going to be talking about the budget for the next three months with the mayor. This is actually the opportune moment to address those right now. So I really thank you for getting that information to the chair and Mr. Chair, thank you again for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me have a follow up question um, regarding what my colleague uh, just uh, mentioned. As, as you be, there is, no assessment taking place then uh, with the agencies anticipating what's going to happen this year. I mean, agencies should be able to determine who's retiring this year uh, and the level of attrition that we're going to face. There, there has to be some kind of matrix that will help us uh, predict at least to be close with a number and how, where are we going to end up a year from now, two years from now? Um, is, is anybody doing that type of work right now? So when we begin that work, it would be, you know, three to four years before the lease expires. So I think this is um, going to be a new exercise for agencies in order to, you know, generally they anticipate based on their uh PS request to OMB. So if they add new staff or if they know people aren't going to be there, those are the numbers that we get. I think this is going to be a new exercise for them. If, if in fact, uh, you know, the dictate going forward is that you're going to reduce your staff by so much by attrition, um, you know, hopefully there aren't terminations. So I think that is going to be an ongoing process. And that would be based on when, you know, three to four years before the lease expires. Well, uh, I would say in consideration of the fact that the next four years, uh, there's gonna be a budgetary gaps every year, huge ones, uh, that as the lease begins to expire, we may need to consolidate agencies coming together uh, in the use of space. And in, in the reality that we're gonna have people, uh, we're gonna have agencies rather, uh, that are gonna, they're gonna face some real reductions. We're just trying to find savings here, uh, in light of the fact that 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 we 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 that it does not look good. 
you know, we, when we look at the budget realities for, for the next four years. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask my moderator, we have uh, another colleague or, and let me recognize we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. And if not, I'll continue with my questions. At this time, I'm seeing no hands raised. If any council member has any question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing none, I think, Chair, you can go ahead. Thank you so much. I know some of my colleagues uh, want to see our new president being inaugurated. And so I that that temptation, uh, my TV is on. I, I'm doing this right now. And so um, it's, it's a momentous moment. Uh, in, in the history of the United States. I, I wanted to ask you, DCAS has a project, does DCAS have a projection for revenue for from leases uh, for fiscal year 21? So we are looking at about $45 million from our long-term leases um, and about 5 million in annual revenue from our short-term leases. Those of course will fluctuate and we don't have a projection at this time if there's going to be uh, any, in the, in the long-term lease, we don't anticipate any decrease. Short-term, we could have tenants that want to relinquish their, their spaces. Um, so right now we do not have a prediction of, of if those numbers are going to decrease at all. Okay. We don't know yet. Uh, one of the department's goals in, 20, in the 2020 mayor's uh, management report is to consolidate and reduce city office space. And so the logical question then is how, how has the total amount of private space leased by the city changed over the past several years? How do you expect it to change over the next several years? I think part you partly answered that already. And how has the total amount of money the city spends on rent for private space change over the past several years? And do you expect to change it over the next several years? Sure, thanks for that question. Um, you know, over, uh, we started a, an aggressive cost savings initiative uh, in conjunction working closely with OMB um, in 2017. And uh, you, Despite having hired, um, you know, many more city employees, we have been able to keep the real estate portfolio about the same in terms of square footage. So this past fiscal year, we only entered into 24 either amendments, new agreements, extensions of leases, and that is down significantly from the prior five years. So that's a trend we, we want to continue to see. And of course, if um, if the, the workforce declines in size, then we will continue on that trend. And as far as the cost savings have been, um, you know, we have largely met our targets. And in, in FY20, uh, we had a space savings target from OMB at 5 million. And we, uh, by the January plan, we had saved 800,000. And by the end of the fiscal year, the $4.2 million. And that's just in savings. And additionally, um, we have saved since the program began about 12.7 million in cost avoidance, meaning that we've been able to reconfigure spaces or consolidate in order to get those employees in those spaces. I'm happy to hear those numbers and uh, looking forward how we could continue that trend. Uh, in its annual report, DCAS stated that at least 700,561 square feet of private sector office space in fiscal year 2019. I just need a clarification. Does this refer to leases where the city was the landlord or the tenant? I'll just, can you, can you say that again? Sure. So in the, in, in the annual report, right? Uh, mm -hmm. DCAS stated that at least 730, 700,561 square feet of private sector office space in fiscal year 2019. So what we need to know, I just need clarification, does this refer to leases where the city was the landlord or the tenant? That refers to where the city was the tenant. Okay, that was easy. Uh, uh, are there any properties that DCAS typically leases to private tenants that are currently vacant? And if so, what, are, what is the vacancy rate? If units are vacant, are these vacancy entirely due to COVID-19? If not, why are they vacant? So you're asking if the, um, if our private sector leases, leases that the city takes from private space are vacant and if we have subleased them? Uh, if, 
uh, any other properties that you you're right now leasing just to be clear uh to private tenants are uh, are there any of them vacant at this moment so city owned property that we lease a city owned private. property correct so not that we know of i mean there are um there are various lots around the city that we will do short-term leases from. And, and there are definitely lots that aren't leased, haven't been leased. But as far as the ones that are currently leased, I mean, we don't we don't monitor the usage. I, we can't say if uh, they've left, but we haven't had that many relinquishments of those leases. And for the most part, uh, the city is receiving uh, its, its rent and revenue for those sites. And most of the, just to be clear, most of the, your product is you, you mentioned uh, land. Is it, are we talking most of it is land for like parking use or are we talking about buildings? Most of it is land. Most are small lots, yeah. um, you know, much less in terms of buildings. And obviously those would, those would mostly fall into the long-term lease category. I think you answered my next question, but uh, just to uh, have it for the record here, has DCAS renegotiated any leases due to COVID-19 and so why did the city decided to rene renegotiate them? So for our, for, our, for the leases that we take from the private sector, yes. lease, what we call uh, lease in. Um, so what we do is just look at the opportunities to, whether there's an opportunity to renegotiate leases. You know, I think um, for the most part, if we have a, a long-term lease and there's no out clause and, you know, we need to, to keep that property, there's not an opportunity to negotiate. But on the other hand, if we have, let's say, if we're at year seven and there's an option at, at year 10 to vacate that property and give notice on a 20 year lease that we're going to be leaving at year 10, that can provide an opportunity to negotiate. So if what we're paying is over fair market value at the time, we would certainly look at that and, uh, and, and see if we can save money there. But have you have any that it was uh, re the renegotiation took place as a result of COVID-19? And I, I would imagine probably not because most of them are land lease, you know, it's land for parking, I would imagine, but uh, I don't want to assume. Oh, so you're asking about our city owned sites that yeah. we have asked to renegotiate. Um, we have had some tenants approach us about renegotiating. Um, we have not, uh, we haven't done so yet. And I, I think that's in, in general because um, our responsibility under the charter is to get fair market value for our properties. And we haven't seen, um, you know, those numbers move. We generally do appraisals and uh, on these short term leases um, every few years. Um, so there, there may be some turnaround um, for long term leases. Also, we look for, for whatever the fair market value is going to be. Let me recognize we've been joined also by Council Member Rosenthal. Welcome. Uh, are there any city owned spaces being leased they haven't received payment? We have had some of our tenants request extensions and we have been giving those extensions. Do you know how many? It's under, I believe, 25. 25 out of 400? Out of, right, out of the 78 plus the 346 short term. So, yeah, over 400. What do you anticipate is going to happen there? Uh, you know, I think it, it largely depends on um, what happens with the economy, you know, if, if we can recover and these can stay, you know, it, it, we have a really vast, uh, diverse portfolio of who the tenants are. Um, so I, I think so far, it, it looks pretty good, but we can't speak for all of them. As part of its space management, uh, space management initiative, DCAS was working towards developing a unified computer system that will have all lease information in one place, as you know. Uh, has DCAS acquired the system? And if not, when would it acquire it? And how are payments on leases initiated through the software? So we, we have acquired this. Not only have we acquired it, we are um, starting our phase two of implementation. So we have started our space management. We have over 5 million square feet of our entire portfolio already surveyed and in that system. And we continue to do that work even during COVID to, to keep adding square footage. Our goal is, you know, to get um, 
22 million square feet into that system as, as soon as we can, because it really helps with tracking. We have started with actually the, the transferring the billing system for our private properties that we lease to uh, the public. Um, and that is well underway as well. In addition, all of our lease in, so the, the over 400 leases and licenses that I mentioned will all be in that system um, but they're actually already in that system and we're migrating from the old IPIS system to this is the new system, which is called Archivist. And when do you anticipate uh, you will have completed all the entries? Most of those entries have already been uh, completed. The things that have not been completed, our, our design and project management team is still working on their rollout and our, um, our planning and disposition team is also still working on their rollout. And we expect that that would be completed within the next year or so. Very good, impressive, great job. Uh, yeah. And it's uh, 2019 annual report, DCAS detail a plan search, quote unquote search site or multi-agency share workspace on the 25th floor of one center street. What is the status of this project? Has DCAS reconsidered the use of multi-agency share workspace within the COVID-19 context and social distancing and hygiene protocols? Well, thank you for that question. Um, you know, this was a, a site that we were really excited to, to launch. Um, right now, it's a slightly on hold given the funding situation, but we hope to uh, eventually have it moving again. And, you know, do, uh, I think the pause, um, just given the fiscal crisis, um, allowed us to kind of evaluate and look at what the best practices are for office design. And, and I think we had the conversation before um, at a previous hearing that, that DCAS had done a lot of work to look at best practices in office design, that our 2008 space standards, you know, were somewhat outdated. And, and what do we see in, in the best places to work in the, in the private sector and public sector? And we toured a lot of those sites. It looks at this point that a lot of what we were going to implement still will be relevant even post COVID. Um, and this involves, you know, uh, more open spaces, more collaboration spaces, of course, you know, there might be a, a, a time delay in terms of when people are comfortable coming back to work in those spaces. But I think even post COVID, it, it will be more crucial than ever to, to have drop down spaces, surge sites, places that need to be renovated because, uh, you know, they need new systems with, that the city can have somewhere for this to go. I think our biggest challenge um, of designing this site and implementing it was going to be technology. You know, the city before COVID didn't really have the ability to, to be 100% remote or wireless, but the city um, amazingly did that, you know, in a very short amount of time. So that now is not our major concern. And I think it will be easier to implement this site easier than ever once we can get it going. Uh, you know, in light of what I was mentioning before, consolidating agencies, this might be the model of the future, uh, especially if we want to have uh, high levels of attrition, at least in the foreseeable future. Uh, so uh, this might be a model. I think that might work. Are you waiting an OMB to get back to you regarding uh, uh, co uh, construction funding and how much are you short? So I, I don't think we're short. I think we do have the money in the budget for the most part. I think um, ONB has been, uh, you know, slow to approve the, the CPs. And I think that's just, you know, waiting until we're sure and, and where should the money go uh, immediately. And, and certainly, um, you know, it doesn't really cost the city to wait to do this. Um, so as soon as, as that happens, I, I think there still is interest. And, and, you know, we're happy to hear you say that you think that this is the kind of wave of the future. We do too. And you know we're anxious to proceed with it. And in light of that, how confident are you and what's your assessment of the level of readiness for people to go back to their offices? And there is a new technology. As a matter of fact, I had a great meeting uh, with one of its reps uh, that is used by, I don't know if you're familiar with it, by the military and, uh, and other institutions that basically neutralizes. Uh, and I, as a matter of fact, the Board of Education right now, I believe is going through his procuring process uh, for it, that it neutralizes um, viruses like COVID-19, not just COVID-19, from, from being transmitted from one person to another. Have you taken a look at it? 
in other types of, I, I want to call this one a filtration system because what it does, it neutralizes. But have you looked at new technology uh, to help us deal with COVID-19 and future viruses? So I'm going to pass that question to my colleague, Quentin Haynes, who's been working on our return to office citywide policy. Great. Sure. Thanks, Laura. Uh, uh, Chair, thank you for that question. And yes, we have been looking at a lot of different technologies. Um, uh, a lot of uh, innovative technologies are coming out. Um, I believe we're talking about something similar where you were mentioning the military um, and, and that uh, a solution as far as um, it being able to be a coat on on filters um, where it can potentially neutralize the transmission of COVID-19 and other uh, uh, aerosols um, throughout filtration systems. We are looking at that. Um, so I'm glad to hear that that's something that uh, you have heard about as well. Again, we're working with our partners with DOHMH and we're also looking for guidance um, from the CDC and DOH from the state to make sure that the, the efficacy of these solutions um, are actually uh, something that can be utilized. And so um, those are really all in the trial phases. Um, we've been in touch with some of the vendors that have approached us with some of these uh, solutions and we're looking at both the efficacy, but also seeing whether they work within our buildings. As you know, our building portfolio um, and HVAC systems are uh, a little bit older um, than some of the modern systems of new buildings um, that you've been hearing about where a lot of this technology has actually been tried on. So, you know, again, I'm glad to hear that uh, you've been uh, uh, educated on some of these things, but we're also looking into the feasibility of it. So thank you for that. Now, thank you for uh, exploring new technologies. I know there is one that uses the existing uh, central air and is attached to it, but there's another one that has no need for that. Uh, maybe uh, we could speak uh, after this hearing and and I could put you in contact with with some of these companies. And sure, uh, we're we're happy to. That that would be fantastic. Uh, let me. Uh, I only have a few more questions. Has DCAS considered using its city-owned space for any purpose other than office space in the future? For example, affordable housing. If I can take that question, I, you know, I think um, we've discussed before. It, the city currently leases. 22 million square feet from the private sector and our uh, our DCAS portfolio is 15 million square feet. So if anything, I think what we would like to do is save leasing costs by using our buildings more efficiently. Um, it, you know, it's, it's difficult for the city to acquire, to purchase new space. It it's a very time consuming process. And in that process, we, we often lose out on a lot of opportunities. So with the, you know, limited stock that we have, um, what we are looking to do is just maximize that utilization and, and not um, sell it or, you know, give it to the private sector in any way. Yeah, I'm curious as to why does it take so long? And I'm happy to hear that there's no plans to sell any properties. I know in previous administrations, they were selling buildings left and right, and then only to turn around and lease space, and at the end of the day, use those resources that we, that we acquire through the selling of our properties. Uh, there's nothing like having real estate. Uh, why does it take so long to acquire a property? So mostly because of Euler, right? It, it's a process that probably will add an extra year uh, to any deal that the city does. And, you know, sometimes we can get into a, a license agreement before we can even lease, which also requires Euler. But certainly for purchasing, we would need that um, before we can go forward. Uh, and then I, I think the city just has extra due diligence and extra uh, process before, you know, they can spend that kind of yeah. money. Um, but that's why it takes longer. Thank you so much. During the COVID-19 pandemic, H&H &H and IDNYC has sought, up, sought a pop-up sites in private and public spaces for COVID-19 testing, T2 operations, IDNYC enrollment, and now vaccine uh, administration. Has DCAS been involved in assistance to secure space for these pop-up sites? And have these pop-up sites been able to prioritize prioritize vacant space that DCAS manages either city-owned properties or in city lease private properties? Uh, yeah, great question. We, we um, have been extremely active, you know, from the very beginning in helping uh, do those site searches and vetting the sites. So we have right now 56 sites total that we have um, used for either uh, vaccine 
Um, I'm sorry, that is just the COVID testing sites. Now we're working on the vaccine sites as well and PPE distribution sites. And we're working closely with uh, NYCID to identify any other spaces. But we have definitely even approached some of our own tenants to say, can we you know, use some of your space for, for those sites? And at the most part, everyone has been uh, very gracious to help. We have uh, a city leased site even um, you know, that we lease from a private landlord. And you know, I just wanna especially call out this particular landlord because in our original lease agreement it said no medical use and no medical testing um, but they too you know were able to see the the need the urgent need the city had and um, you know waive that requirement and let us use that site um, so you know for these 56 sites we've really been able to uh, make the most of I think our city's you know vast portfolio in terms of um, reallocating uh, in, into the emergency need. That also goes for, I'm sorry, uh, food distribution and PPE distribution, um, you know, where, wherever sites are necessary. DCAS has, you know, worked closely also with EDC in reaching out to all of these sites uh, to, to get whatever we can. And thank you so much for uh, that work. My last question is related to, uh, here's the big question, the local law 75, uh, which, you know, established a task force to recommend agency reopenings. Uh, policies and require agencies to develop their own reopening uh, plans. Have all agencies submitted a plan to to the task force? If not, why not? Uh, what are the greatest hurdle agencies face in making the workspaces compliant and with public health protocol, lack of space, aging infrastructure or something else? And let me just say, being, uh, we've been joined by council member Levin. So I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Quentin Haynes to answer that. But first, if I could just hopefully he won't forget that question, <laughs> um, the length of it. But uh, I did want to get back to you with the Woolworth building. So we did um, two, we leased uh, the 14th and 15th floors, and that was at $53 a square foot. And we also leased the fifth floor at $52 a square foot. And right. At the time, the average downtown Manhattan rent was well above $61 a square foot. So I think, you know, it shows that it, it was a, um, a good deal for the city. I mean, that is way below Manhattan average, but certainly way below downtown Manhattan as well. And, and I appreciate uh, that you were able to get that amazing rate, especially in that building and especially that close uh, to City Hall. I'm impressed and I'm impressed that you were able to get... Thank uh, the, the numbers uh, before this hearing it was over. Uh, sure, thank so good. And Quentin can answer, I think, your question. Sure. Um, and Chair, thank you for that question. Uh, the health and safety of our workforce is our number one priority. Um, so to your point, I am uh, glad to, to announce and also uh, as shown in the recent report that we provided the City Council that all agencies have uh, submitted their initial return to office or restart what we're calling restart plans um, to the restart task force. Um, and we continue to work with them to update. As you know, um, uh, COVID-19 changes uh, every day. Um, and so we are currently working with them to revise plans um, in, in preparation for the eventual return. So it yes, all, oh, I'm sorry. So, sorry, go ahead, sir. Sorry, no, no, ahead, no, sir. I thought you were finished, go ahead. I know I was just saying that all, all agents, but all agencies have uh, submitted their plans. All of the agencies, anything that stood out? Uh, no, I think I think for for us, what we are really looking at is every agency is different. Every agency has different employees, and so um, as the process goes along, we're working with agencies directly to ensure that their workforce um, and the guidance that we've promulgated over the past couple of months and the guidance that we continue to get, um, it, it makes sense for their workforce, um, and that's inclusive of working with labor, that's inclusive working with management, and also hearing employee concerns and addressing those um, as they come up. Do you happen to know why it took them so long to come up with a response? I mean, it was due back in October 24. Um, do, do, do you know in particular why? And, and so you're talking about a response to the, the plans or and and it, uh, in regards to the agency submitting a plan. So all the agencies the actually said We just got the report yesterday. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure when you, so if you're saying you got the report yesterday, all agencies had yesterday. submitted it. As you, as you can imagine, over 80 agencies, um, City Hall dealing with COVID-19, but also 
um, ensuring that agencies were actively preparing um, and in implementing the guidance. It took a little bit of time to actually go through all those reports. Um, and so I would I would charge that to the, the time delay, um, but it hasn't been a lack thereof of us communicating and working with them to actually implement um, and see that they have the resources to implement those plans. So as I understand, we only got reports from 71 agencies. So there are some missing. So I'd be happy to follow up offline uh, to figure out which agencies that reports that you don't have and make sure that you get those. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the sooner we can get them, the sooner uh, the city could comply uh, with local law 75. I don't have any more question. I really enjoyed this conversation and dialogue, information you provided. Uh, I, it's, it's vital information uh, and uh, we're here to support you in any way possible, making sure we, we make a good transition. Uh, I don't believe, uh, I'm gonna give it back to the moderator. I don't believe we have any questions from my colleagues from what I can see here. Uh, and then we'll go, uh, we'll, transition to the next panelist, but thank you so much. Keep up the great work that you're doing. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function. I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Susan Lerner to testify. Your time starts now. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Chairman Cabrera and members of the committee for inviting me to testify. I am Susan Lerner, the Executive Director of Common Cause New York. And I am pleased to be here today to testify in support of intro number 374. Uh, this bill, I think, fills a uh, unexpected gap in our city law, uh, which uh, would, if passed and adopted, would harmonize city law with state law in setting necessary qualifications for those who can uh, stand for the privilege of being an elected officer. Uh, in my experience as a good government advocate, the vast majority of our elected officials are very public spirited individuals who desire to provide service to the public uh, and who are motivated by a desire to help all New Yorkers uh, achieve the prosperity and health uh, that we all uh, want for ourselves. But every now and then, unfortunately, we find that there are individuals um, who have found uh, the privileges of the office uh, to be a little uh, irresistible and who have quite frankly abused the public trust. And this bill would ensure that those who run for city office have not been found guilty of abusing the public trust. So it's not uh, a prohibition against running for office if you have been accused of public corruption, but rather if you have indeed been found guilty. Uh, and there are uh, specific statutes uh, that are enumerated in the law, which are the appropriate types of abuses of power that we do not want to see individuals who've been convicted of then turn around and at some later date, um, yet, yet again, try the public's patience um, by running for public office. So we feel this is a necessary um, closing of the gap as I said, uh, and an appropriate list of convictions for the abuse of public trust, because after all, it is a privilege to run for public office uh, and to be able to serve the public that way. I would suggest that it might be appropriate for the committee to consider expanding the list of abuses of convictions, which would prohibit you from holding public office by taking a look at 
uh, the idea that if a individual has been found guilty of domestic violence, the sort of domestic violence which requires a mandatory arrest, that that might also be a prohibition uh, for holding public office. Domestic violence is unlike other forms of criminal culpability. We found right. that those who are guilty of, of domestic violence uh, have a tendency to repeat uh, and also uh, to move into other forms of abuse. Uh, but we are strong supporters of this bill and we thank uh, the council for considering it. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh... I have a question, but I, I first I want to turn it uh, to my colleague, uh, Council Member Yeager, who, ha who also has a question. Time starts now. Okay, there was just a technical glitch with getting me unmuted. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Lerner, good morning. Um, I, you answered one of my questions uh, without me asking, but only partially. I was going to ask you if there are any other crimes that you would suggest being listed uh, in this statute. And um, uh, you mentioned one, uh, but interestingly, I, it doesn't appear to me that the crime of homicide is uh, listed in the statute. So what you would suggest is that uh, somebody with a conviction for domestic violence be barred from holding public office, but somebody with a conviction for murder uh, be welcomed into the city council with balloons and graffiti and uh, whatnot. So, so interesting to hear your opinion on that. <laughs> so, you know, I think one has to be discerning in terms of the uh, sorts of convictions which indicate a real abuse of the public trust. I think there are situations where individuals have shown true remorse and rehabilitation. Um, I think it would be up to the voters to determine if an individual who had been guilty of murder at some time in the past had truly rehabilitated. Um, but I think what we're concerned about is holding um, public officials to the highest standard of not abusing the public trust. So the uh, convictions, the crimes that are enumerated in the statute currently are ones that are direct abuse of the public trust. Um, uh, the type of fraud and embezzlement and bribery which public officials, unfortunately, um, you know, happily, not frequently, but have <laughs> fallen prey to in the past. And I mention domestic violence because I think it really is in a category of its own as, we, as it has been studied more, that it tends to be a pattern and a repeat crime. And it also indicates a attitude which makes the person um, less empathetic, um, problematic in terms of supervising staff um, and bringing certain biases to the position that the public really uh, should uh, not encourage in public officers. So just to be clear before I move on to my next question, a murderer likely to manage his or her staff better than somebody convicted of domestic violence. Just want to because, make sure that we're on the same page. On, because know, I'm, what I'm we only, have seen. Your answer, that's your answer, but I'll, so I'll what, go to my next question. Well, uh, what I, let me just say that what we have seen is that there are a limited number of crimes which tend to be patterns and which are difficult, if not impossible, to rehabilitate an individual from. Murder, I understand, and I'm not a criminologist, I'm a good government advocate, is not one of those crimes that people do not um, uh, rehabilitate from. But again, I, remember, I can that no I can office is automatic. The voter has to approve the candidate. Ms. Lerner, but today we're talking about what 26 people plus the mayor are going to decide. Uh, not what the voters are going to decide. We're, we're, we're so, so on some of these questions, we're okay with 26 random New Yorkers who happen to gather together uh, on, a, on a video camera deciding this question. And on others, let us leave it up to the voters. And that's okay if, you, if that's your position, but the penal laws are booked this thick. And I'm saying that, I'm suggesting perhaps that there are a lot of crimes in there that are pattern crimes, but that's okay. If that's your answer, that's your answer. That's good. I wanna go to the next question. Um, 
the bill the bill accepts uh, uh, EC accepts uh, um, those convictions that have uh, been vacated pursuant to the criminal procedure law, which I don't have a problem with because that's that's uh, that's the criminal justice system working, um, or pardoned by the governor. So, are we? Do you believe that it ought to be okay if somebody receives a pardon? Uh, if somebody has been convicted of one of these enumerated crimes, and perhaps the extra one that you listed, but certainly not murder, um, uh, but and then receives a pardon, a pardon from the governor. Uh, and then, you know, this whole bill goes away and they can come and serve here as mayor of New York. So you, in all honesty, I do not have a clear idea of the laws relating to pardons. Um, and so I really do not have a uh, opinion on that particular aspect, but it's my understanding, limited as it is, that pardons are fairly absolute. Uh, and I don't know that the council has the authority to override a pardon, um, but Time. I myself have not researched that question. Well, the question, of course, is that is not the council. The council has the authority to set the qualifications for elected office uh, within the charter. And um, uh, if the council sets this statute and simply deletes the words, or pardoned by, I'm sorry, I'm looking at another screen. So mm -hmm. that's pardoned by the governor pursuant to section four of article four of the New York state constitution of a felony defined in, and it sets forth the statutes. But the, par, the, the first of all, there's no exception for a pardon by the president. I guess perhaps that's a good thing um, today, but maybe we won't feel that way starting in, you know, uh, 49 minutes. Um, but the gover we can get a governor that does pardons the same way. Um, aren't we concerned that somebody convicted uh, by a jury of his or her peers of one of these terrible crimes and then gets a pardon by the governor can just come back in and, you know, sit next to Chair Cabrera in the city council and all is good? He's a forgiving man, of course, but we're trying to get the charter to not be as forgiving. So I want to take a look at the specific confines Fair of enough. the pardon law in New York before I opine. Okay, and, and check out that whole murder issue because that seems to me like the kind of thing we don't want any murderers in the council either, I would think. Okay. If, we, if we're gonna do this, if we don't believe in second chances, I think we ought to not have murderers, I'm just saying. And also this, the penal law is this thick, so maybe pick up a couple of, I mean, we should probably pick a couple of other crimes and say, you know, these are the kinds of things that maybe, I mean, jaywalking, sure, come and join us. But maybe there are some things that we ought not. But thank you very much, Ms. Learn. It's really good mm -hmm. to see you. I hope you're having a wonderful new year. And thank uh, you, Mr. You Chair, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. To my colleagues, so matter of fact, uh, I'm gonna have a follow-up question with that. Uh, I noticed also in the list that uh, convicted pedophiles are not in the list. And pedophiles are 95% likely to be repeaters, mm -hmm. more than any other crime. Uh, I, I, it just, it, I, I think, and Ms. Lauren, he, here's my concern with this bill. My concern is, it's taking away the power from the people to decide who they want in office. I, as a matter of fact, the outcry of the civil rights movement, we just had the MLK uh, it's a, it's a memorial and celebration, is that the power should be in the hands of the people to determine their future of who the elected official is going to be. And I, I, I'm concerned. I'm concerned. And I, I noticed that in Congress, in Congress, we don't have such rule. And I think Congress should have a higher, the highest bar. And I'm wondering why not at congressional level, as a matter of fact, uh, there have been there was one, at least one case that I know of, someone in these categories uh, that made it uh, through. The second question I was gonna ask you and related to this is that the state laws, uh, as I understand, and please help me here, uh, as I understand it, is that only if a judge has passed a ruling uh, to prohibit someone from running in the future uh, where they will not be allowed to run, uh, 
in any other case, they are allowed to run, just like we have seen uh, people in this very last assembly and, and Senate election. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering if the bar at the congressional level is as low as you could get to let the people decide. Uh, at the state level, which makes sense to me for a judge to be able to assess the situation. Uh, you know, I can see that, but why, why take away the power from the people to decide who the elected official is gonna be? Well, I think, frankly, we support having definitions for uh, what are uh, appropriate qualifications at every level of government. We would certainly support the sort of prohibition at the congressional level. Um, we have a constitutional prohibition, which in the future may be, in the near future may be tested in the 13th amendment regarding those who are guilty of uh, sedition or treason on uh, not being uh, uh, permitted to hold public office. Uh, I think it is well within the jurisdiction of each level of government uh, to determine who uh, should be eligible for the privilege of public office. We set uh, age limitations. Uh, and I think when we have individuals who have very directly abused the public trust, it is appropriate to say that once you have abused the public trust, you may not have the privilege of running for office again, because you don't Public office is an obligation and a privilege. And I think that a jurisdiction and certainly a legislative body has the inherent power to decide who it will accept as a member and to define that transparently and in advance is I think the best practice because then it is clear to the public. Um, the public can comment this is or is not an appropriate standard um, and it is a bright line and clear guidance for individuals. And therefore, we believe that a prohibition of this sort is appropriate, as opposed to taking on a on a one by one basis, as this very body has had to do in the near past. I think that we could we and I hear what you're saying. Uh, I hear what you said this morning. I, I think there is the danger uh, for this bill. Uh, to be politicized. I mean, somebody with mail fraud is not allowed to run, and yet somebody who we just saw in the Capitol two weeks ago will be able to run, who committed crimes of homeland terrorism, in my estimation. And I, it, it, there is a big, huge danger. I, I, I like to keep systems pure as pure as could be. And I trust our community, I trust New Yorkers to be able to make that just judgment. I'm also concerned that as we talk about justice reform and believing that people's life, that there is redemption. And I think it's up to the people to decide. We might never have somebody who get elected in New York City who have committed uh, those crimes that we have listed. But I, I think that uh, New Yorkers are, are wise enough. And here's the other thing uh, to consider. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Jaeger, who's a lawyer, will, will probably uh, be better able to address this issue. But we have the ex post factor issue here that we're not gonna be able to go backwards. Somebody who negotiated with a DA, neg negotiated with a DA uh, eight years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, let's say 30 years ago, they didn't have uh, the knowledge that as they were negotiating their deal uh, with the DA that potentially they could have been uh, denied the opportunity to run so this will only work, work moving forward. I mean, constitutionally, I don't see how we could uh, go backwards as well. 
So uh, I would like to point out that when it comes to people who participated in insurrection in Washington, D.C., that the U.S. Constitution applies all the way down to every jurisdiction and holding every office. But again, I think one has to be selective. I don't think the entire penal code um, and it, crimes unrelated, um, primarily crimes unrelated to the abuse of public office should be included. I think that's a bit of a slippery slope. But I do think, again, that having guidance um, and a clear ethical standard is appropriate in terms of helping the public maintain its faith in our elected officials. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Lerner. Uh, it's always a joy uh, to speak with you and, uh, and for your years of, of service. I, I always enjoy the, the dialogues that we have when, when you're here. Uh, and with that, uh, if the moderator, I believe we don't have uh, any other panelists, that's correct? Beautiful. So okay. with that, uh, we'll, we'll be concluding. I want to thank my colleagues. I want to thank the staff uh, for making this a very productive uh, hearing today. And uh, I'm sure everybody's going to be running right now uh, to see the inauguration of a new, new elected uh, president, Joe Biden. Uh, we congratulate him and we wish him and uh, the very, very best. His win is our win. With that, we to con conclude today's hearing. Are we off? <laughs>